Today's video is brought to you by NordVPN, making everything about your internet experience just a bit better. More on them in a bit. Gambling is one of humanity's oldest forms of entertainment. It's a hobby based on greed, the idea that you could earn yourself a fortune overnight with just one lucky spell at the tables. Every year, millions visit the casinos, palatial resorts that draw you in with dreams of striking it rich, and almost all of them leave having gained nothing but a good time. One gambler, however, had his own idea for how to make a fortune from a casino. It didn't involve a lucky hand, though, but a bomb, one of the largest and most complex improvised explosive devices ever seen by American law enforcement. The bomber's big gamble was that the casino and the cops would rather pay his ransom than risk the lives of innocent casino patrons. This is the true story of the Harvey's Casino bombing, a crime so unbelievable that it makes you wonder why they haven't made a movie about it yet. It has it all, piles of money, a nationwide manhunt, tons of media attention, and of course, a big bang. State Line, Nevada, is barely a speck on the map. The unincorporated community on the south shore of Lake Tahoe only has 850 year-round residents. The only thing it has going for it is its strategic location. As its name suggests, it's right on the border between California and Nevada. To the west of State Line is the California city of South Lake Tahoe, one of the state's biggest tourist playgrounds. The lake, the sixth largest in the U.S. after the Great Lakes, offers plenty of fun during the summer, while the surrounding Sierra Nevada mountains provide for some of the finest ski slopes in America in the winter. One thing the city doesn't have, though, is gambling, since it's illegal in California. And that's where State Line comes in. By 1980, there were four casinos in State Line, conveniently located as close to the California border as possible. The hotels on the California side of the border routinely organize bus trips to and from the casinos, a profitable enterprise for everyone but the tourists. One of these casinos was Harvey's Wagon Wheel Resort and Casino. Harvey's was the first casino opened in the area in 1944, and 20 years later, owner Harvey Gross opened a gambling palace to rival anything in Las Vegas at the time, an 11-story building with multiple gaming floors and almost 200 hotel rooms. It was Harvey Gross's pride and joy, the culmination of a lifetime of work for the one-time butcher from Sacramento, and it made him exceedingly rich. At 5.30 a.m. on August 26, 1980, Bob Vinson, the casino's night shift supervisor, was heading down to the gift shop to buy a packet of cigarettes when he noticed a strange object sitting on the floor in the storage area on the second floor. It was a large steel box with a smaller box welded to the top of it. 28 toggle switches were the only thing marring the smooth silver surfaces of the object, carefully numbered and arranged in rows. On top of the box was an envelope with a typewritten note inside it. Vincent summoned security supervisor Simon Caban, who read the note and realized to his horror that this thing was a bomb, supposedly with enough explosive power to blow up the entire building and everyone in it. By the time dawn broke over the mountains, the scene around Harvey's casino was chaotic. The entire resort was immediately evacuated, many guests standing outside in their bathrobes or without shoes on while they awaited transportation to a local high school for temporary lodging. Police cordoned off the street, while bomb squad officers and federal agents poured over the site, examining the device in detail. Their prognosis wasn't good. The bomb was so complex in its construction that there was no way that it was fake, as one officer noted, no one would go through all of that effort and then fill the thing up with kitty litter. What was worse, the thing was loaded with booby traps. It could not be moved, drilled into, or opened without setting it off. For most of the people looking at it, including some of the country's foremost explosive experts, it was both the largest and most complex improvised explosive device that they'd ever encountered. Investigators turned to the note that came with the bomb. Like the device itself, the note was far more complicated than the usual handwritten, this is a bomb, pay me a ransom or else, that they were used to seeing. It was three typewritten pages which bragged about how complex the device was and provided extraordinarily detailed instructions for delivering $3 million in ransom money via helicopter to a remote spot in the mountains north of town. Even if the ransom was paid, the note claims that the bomb couldn't be disarmed, not even by the person that made it. What they could do, however, was provide instructions on how to turn off the motion sensing detector so that it could be safely removed and detonated off-site. The FBI agents in charge went to Harvey Gross to see if he was willing to pay the ransom. Now, Harvey obviously didn't want to see his casino blown up, but he also didn't want anybody to get hurt trying to move the bomb. After all, they only had the bomber's words that it could be rendered safe enough to move without going off. With that being the case, the casino magnate told the FBI that he wouldn't give those sons of a any of his money. 
At midnight that night, a helicopter took off from Lake Tahoe Airport, heading into the mountains to look for a strobe light that was the signal from the bomber for the helicopter to land. On board was the Branson, actually cut up newspaper with about $1,000 in cash mixed in to make it look real. The FBI also hoped to capture the bomber at the drop off point for the ransom, but there was a mix up. The helicopter went to the wrong place. It was forced to return empty handed. The governor of Nevada, Robert List, went over the radio to announce that the authorities were still willing to make the ransom drop, but the bomber just needed to contact them again. In the meantime, though, there was still a gigantic bomb ticking down to detonation inside of Harvey's, and they needed to figure out what to do about it. So it's a familiar situation. You're at the coffee shop, the airport, wherever, and there's that sign. Free Wi-Fi. It's got those five strong bars of reception, but should you click on it? Could it be a trap? Could someone be looking to intercept your data, get into your personal information, your bank account, etc.? Well, I'll tell you what, you can use that Wi-Fi totally safely if you have the caution of having NordVPN installed on your PC, your Mac, your phone, whatever. Just fire up Nord, hit connect, go onto that Wi-Fi and do whatever you want online because no one is breaking through Nord's incredible encryption, keeping other people's eyes off your browsing. And that's all good, but that's only when you're out and about. The best thing for me about a VPN is more streaming options. Close Netflix, fire up Nord, choose America, and boom, a whole new range of Netflix stuff, new homepage, new shows, it's all there. There, it works for a bunch of streaming services. Plus, you can use NordVPN on six devices. All major platforms are supported. So, look, get the safety, get the cool extra stuff, streaming, downloading games in regions where you're not supposed to be able to get them, etc. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash bio and you'll get a two year plan with four months for free. And now back to today's video. Twenty-four hours after the bomb scare started, the eyes of America's media were all trained on state line. Beyond the quarter mile cordon established by the police, a large crowd of curious onlookers had gathered, most of them probably hoping to see the building blow up. Some enterprising businessmen had started printing t-shirts that said, I got bombed at Harvey's, and was doing brisk business selling them to gawkers. Rumors swirled around town that gamblers were placing bets in the other still open casinos about whether or not the bomb was going to go off. Across the street at the Sahara, some of the nation's leading explosive experts gathered at the incident command post. They included army EOD technicians, civilian scientists, to design bombs for the military, even representatives from the newly created Nuclear Emergency Search Team, NEST, whose job it is to respond to criminal incidents where nuclear weapons might be involved. They, together with police and FBI bomb experts, debated about what to do with the Harvey's bomb. Every idea that was floated for disarming the device was shot down as unworkable. Finally, a civilian who worked for the Navy, Leonard Wolfson, suggested a solution that sounded insane at first. And that was more explosives. The idea was to place a shaped charge of the plastic explosive C4 on the device. When detonated, the charge would decapitate the brain of the bomb located in the smaller box stacked on top of all of the explosives, before it had a chance to trigger the wiring that would set off the bomb. It was a risky plan, but it seems like the only one they could come up with that had any chance of disarming the bomb. That afternoon, a very nervous police bomb tech placed the specially constructed charge next to the bomb, precisely checking the angles and distances to ensure that it was in the correct position. At 3.45 p.m., almost 35 hours after the bomb was placed, the police set off the C4. It was immediately obvious that the attempt to disarm the bomb had failed. The entire payload detonated, ripping through the casino floor and the hotel rooms above. The windows of the Haraz Casino across the street were blown out as a cloud of billowing debris and rubble fell all over the place. The crowd of onlookers cheered and laughed as they watched the bomb go off. The explosion was covered from all sides by news cameras, and the footage was soon broadcast worldwide. Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but the building was severely damaged, the blast leaving a crater five stories deep within the building. Investigators spent weeks sifting through the debris, looking for parts of the bomb, alongside personnel from the casino who were looking for over a million dollars worth of cash and casino chips that had been left behind when the building was evacuated and were now just lying around everywhere. Amazingly, the bomb hadn't knocked the casino down and hadn't even put all of the slot machines and gaming tables out of action. Harvey's partially reopened two days after the bombing and went back into full operation the next year after repairs totaling $18 million. With the immediate crisis over, investigators now had one very important question left to answer. Who was responsible for this? Among the 200,000 Hungarian refugees that fled their native country after the failed uprising against the communist government in 1956 was a 35-year-old man named Janos Berges and his wife, 
Elizabeth. Later Bergers I would later tell people that had flown for the Axis during World War II and had been taken prisoner by the Soviet Union, but no evidence has surfaced to verify these claims. The couple moved to Fresno, a California city about 250 miles south of Lake Tahoe, and anglicized their names, as many immigrants do. Big John, as he became known, started a successful landscaping business while Elizabeth managed the family-owned restaurant, the Villa Basque. They had two sons, John Jr., known as Johnny, and James, or Jimmy. By the early 1970s, it seemed they were living every immigrant family's dream of success in their new home. Big John was a millionaire, with a home on 15 acres of land outside of Fresno, a fleet of Mercedes cars, even his own airplane that he taught himself to fly. But all was not well in the Burgess family. Big John had a notoriously bad temper and routinely beat both his wife and his children with his fists, coat hangers, boots, whatever he had readily to hand. Both John and Elizabeth began drinking heavily, and the more they drank, the more they fought. Elizabeth finally had enough and filed for divorce in 1973. Two years later, she was found dead in a field behind the family home. While officially ruled a suicide, an intentional overdose of alcohol and Valium, her sons found the manner of death highly suspicious. They believed their father had killed her. Around the time Elizabeth died, Big John seemed to go off the rails completely. He abruptly sold his landscaping business and began to spend more and more time gambling at the casinos up in Lake Tahoe. His favorite place was Harvey's Wagon Wheel, where he was treated like a high roller, given a complimentary hotel suite, befriended by the staff. He even spent a weekend at Harvey Gross's ranch in 1976, where he was given a chance to fly the casino boss's helicopter. He began spending more and more money, especially at the blackjack tables, and routinely left his sons to fend for themselves for weeks at a time while he gambled away the family fortune up in Tahoe. By the end of the 1970s, Big John was running out of money and he was racking up debt. In 1978, Villa Basque burned to the ground. Police suspected it was torched liberally for the insurance money, which Burgess promptly lost at the casinos. Debt collectors from Harvey's began showing up at his home, looking for payments that they were owed. He desperately tried to make back what it lost by placing still more wages, which only put him further in the hole. Even his health was beginning to fail him in 1979. He was diagnosed with abdominal cancer, which has a high mortality rate even today, let alone back then. With apparently nothing left to lose, Burgess decided to embark on an audacious scheme to reverse his sagging fortunes to get all the money back that he lost, and with interest. John Burgess had always been something of a tinkerer. His workshop was full of half-finished projects and ideas. He was very good with tools. He was comfortable around dynamite as well, and it turned out that getting his hands on half a ton of the stuff was the easy part of his scheme. He and his two sons simply drove up to an unguarded construction site in the middle of the night and stole it from an explosives depot there. Burgess stored the dynamite in his walk-in freezer while he built the bomb. Big John spent months laboring over his device, carefully assembling every piece by hand. He rigged the bomb with eight separate triggering mechanisms, including half a dozen booby traps to prevent the bomb squad from disarming it. He attached aluminium foil to the steel casing of the bomb and wired it so that if someone drilled into the casing, it would complete the circuit and set the device off. He wired the screws used to secure the lid of the bomb to prevent them from being unscrewed. He even wired up a float from a toilet system that would set the bomb off if the bomb squad attempted to flood the trigger mechanism with water or foam. The deadliest trap, of course, was the motion sensor that prevented the device from being moved lest it go off. This posed the greatest risk to the occupants of Harvey's, as it was perfectly plausible for the bomb to blow up accidentally if it was jostled by anything from someone falling on it to an earthquake. Burgess chose Harvey's as his target because it was where he'd lost his money gambling, an estimated $750,000. When his two sons refused to help him put the bomb inside the casino, Big John enlisted the help of two men who used to work at his landscaping business, Terry Hall and Bill Brown. The final member of the conspiracy was Burgess's girlfriend, Joan Williams, who wrote the ransom note and helped transport the various participants around Lake Tahoe. Getting the bomb into the casino was easy too. Early in the morning of August 26th, Burgess, Hall, and Brown rolled up to Harvey's in a white cargo van wearing workmen's coveralls. They wheeled the device right into the building under a canvas tarp that had IBM printed on it. Figuring it was a piece of computer equipment or perhaps a new photocopier, the staff at the casino didn't pay any attention to it as the men placed the bomb, armed it, and then left. By the time the bomb was discovered half an hour later, the three were long gone. After that, everything had gone wrong. The ransom drop was a failure because the helicopter never showed up. The elaborate scavenger hunt described in the ransom note was a ruse. Burgess's plan was to overpower the helicopter pilot, flying the ransom when it arrived at the first drop point, and then steal the chopper, flying the money to a second location, and taking off with it by car. But even if the helicopter with the ransom had shown up, 
this would never have worked. In addition to the ransom being bunk, there was an FBI agent hidden aboard the chopper, armed with an MP5 submachine gun and orders to protect the pilot no matter what. It's likely then that John Burgess would have been shot dead that night had the meetup actually taken place. In the end, Burgess' machinations had simply been too complicated to work. The bomb was so cleverly constructed that the bomb squad wasn't going to risk trying to move it, meaning that Harvey Gross had no interest in paying the ransom. And the instructions of the chopper pilot were so complex that he got lost and the ransom drop never had a chance to take place. The next day, of course, any chance of getting a ransom disappeared when the attempt to disarm the bomb failed and it blew up Harvey's, so they all had to go home empty-handed. Still, all things considered, they were fortunate. No evidence had been left behind linking any of them to the bombing, and they stood a good chance of getting away with it. Assuming, of course, that nobody talked. Despite a $500,000 reward put up by the casino owners of Stateline, the FBI had no concrete leads into who had placed the device at Harvey's. This told investigators that the culprits were likely very close, a family, for instance. As 1980 became 1981, one of the largest and most expensive investigations in FBI history was going absolutely nowhere. Then in June of 1981, a Fresno man named Danny DePerry decided to take his shot at claiming the half-million-dollar reward. He told investigating agents about a story his ex-girlfriend, Kelly Cooper, had told him. You see, one of Kelly's other exes was John Burgess Jr., and Kelly had been present the first time Jimmy told his brother about the scheme their father was cooking up to extort money from Harvey's casino. When she read in the newspaper that $50,000 worth of dynamite had been stolen from a construction site not long after, she suspected the Burgess family had something to do with it, and apparently told Danny all about her suspicions. This probably wouldn't have meant anything by itself, but it just happened that the FBI had already talked to Johnny Burgess because a white cargo van registered in his name had been seen in the parking lot of a Lake Tahoe hotel the night before the bomb had been placed in the casino, and the agents felt that the story he gave them for why it was up there was highly suspicious. After that, the whole story started coming out. FBI agents looked into Big John Burgess and found lots to be suspicious about. The compulsive gambling, the fire at his restaurant, believed to be an insurance arson job, the mysterious death of his ex-wife Elizabeth, his bad temper, and his affinity for building things. Then, of course, you had the fact that Joan Williams' car had crashed in the Lake Tahoe area the night the ransom drop had taken place, and the fact that Johnny Burgess had been pulled over for speeding on a highway leading from Lake Tahoe back to Fresno the next day. His brother was in the passenger seat, and his father was in the back. On August the 14th, 1981, FBI agents brought Johnny and Jimmy Burgess in for interrogation. After three hours of stonewalling, both brothers decided that they weren't about to go to jail for a father that had abused them and mistreated them their entire lives. They told the cops everything. The next day, Big John and Joan Williams were arrested. Incredibly, at the time of his arrest, John Burgess was planning another bomb. In fact, he'd already stolen more dynamite. In March 1985, after almost four years of legal maneuvering, John Burgess Sr. was convicted on eight of the nine federal charges against him in connection to the Harvey's Casino bombing. He was sentenced to life in prison, dying there in 1996. To the end, Big John never came clean. His ego wouldn't allow him to deny that he'd built the bomb, which everyone admitted was ingenious, but he would always claim someone else had forced him to do it, a mysterious mobster that prosecutors said was a figment of his imagination. Bill Brown and Terry Hall both received seven years in prison for their part in the bomb plot, so did Joan Williams, but her conviction was later overturned on appeal. Johnny and Jimmy Burgess, in exchange for testifying against the rest of the group, including their father, received immunity and walked free, not having spent so much as one night behind bars for their part in the bombing. The Harvey's Casino bombing slipped off the front page not long after it happened, as the country turned into Ronald Reagan's election as president and all the headlines of the 1980s that followed. Harvey Gross died in 1983. His casino was bought by corporate casino titan Caesars Entertainment, which still operates the now much larger Harvey's Casino in State Line. One place that hasn't forgotten the Harvey's case is the FBI. At the time, the Harvey's bomb was the largest IED ever set off on American soil, and has since only been surpassed by the far more infamous bombings of the World Trade Center in 1993 and the Oklahoma City bomb in 1995. FBI bomb techs built a plexiglass model of Harvey's bomb that is still used today as a training tool at the FBI's training academy in Quantico, Virginia. Perhaps the scariest part about this incident is the fact that even all these years later, most explosive experts familiar with the case still aren't sure if there was a way to safely disarm the device John Burgess built without it exploding. If there is such a thing as an undefeatable bomb, this was it. And that, of course, opens up the possibility, however unlikely, that someone might do it again. 